Will you open with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1? Uh, if you have kids five and under, and if you so desire, you can send your little ones to our nursery, if you so desire. They are also welcome to stay here with us. Shall we pray as we come to God's word? Father in heaven, please bless us and help us to understand what your word says, what it meant to its original recipient, what it means for us today. Please help us, Lord, to understand and to assess the wonderful gift that you have given us in inspiring these books of Scripture to be written for your people. Lord, above all, we desire to be reminded of the work of Christ, so we pray that everything we discuss, not just now, but in the, what follows today, that we would think and speak of all of these things in the context of the work of Jesus, who was given up for our transgressions whom you raised from the dead. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. In all of human experience, one of the most sorrowful words that we have to utter is the word goodbye. There are exceptions to that. Sometimes there are blessed goodbyes. Or sometimes you're on the phone with Mike Howard and something comes up and he goes, gotta go, bye. Does he do that to you too or just me? <laughs> With those exceptions aside, the rule is that when you have to say goodbye to someone, it's usually a sorrowful occasion, isn't it? I grew up in Mountain Home next to an Air Force base, and I grew up saying goodbye. Kids would move into town because their parents got stationed at the base, and you'd make friends for a couple years, and then their parents would get orders, and they'd have to move on. Or when family moves away, or perhaps you are the family who moves away, and you have to say goodbye. And even if you visit, or even if they come to visit, it's a wonderful time, and the clock is ticking in the back of your mind until you have to say goodbye again. Or the final goodbye, when a person leaves this earth. Even in the case of a believer, it's still sorrowful, isn't it? Because... You're confident and you believe and you have faith that we will see each other again in heaven, and yet our parting now is a reminder of the fall, and it is sorrowful. The text that we read today in 1 Timothy 1 is one in which Paul and Timothy had to say goodbye. And even though it was certainly a temporary goodbye, when we look at the circumstances surrounding their parting of ways, it was certainly a sorrowful and a suspenseful goodbye. Will you read with me 1 Timothy 1, starting in verse 3? Paul writes, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus, so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law, without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. I want you to zoom in on that first sentence. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus. What can we glean from this short little command, this short little clause? Paul and Timothy were on a trip together on their way to Macedonia. And on their way to Macedonia, they stopped at the church in Ephesus, which Paul planted just a couple years before. And for some reason, they had to change their plans, and Paul had to keep going to Macedonia, and he had to leave Timothy behind in Ephesus. They had to say goodbye. They had to split up. They had to divide and conquer. So you might ask, why would they have to split up? What in the world could be so important that it would change their plans, and that Paul would need to keep going to Macedonia and leave Timothy behind in Ephesus? Why? 
The simple answer is that the church has gone off the rails. And you read a little bit of that as we continued in the text, didn't you? Why did Paul leave Timothy in Ephesus? Well, because verse 3 says that he's there to charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. In other words, false teachers have crept in. False teachers have infiltrated the church in Ephesus and have begun to teach different doctrine. And they've made a mess of things. And so Paul says, look, I have to keep going to Macedonia. I can't compromise those plans. But somebody's got to stay behind and fix this mess. Can you do it, Timothy? You need to stay here. The church has gone off the rails because false teachers have infiltrated. Now, you can kind of put together a little picture of what their heresy was that they were teaching. Not like a whole exhaustive course, but what we just read was that they are devoting themselves to myths and endless genealogies. They're promoting speculation rather than the stewardship from God that, that, it, that is by faith. In other words, they're not teaching the church the sound doctrine that God wants to feed his flock. They're teaching things that are interesting, but they're a distraction. They promote speculation. They just cause us to go, that is a fascinating thing to think about. But they don't actually spur us on to loving one another and to serving one another. You continue on, and uh, in, at the end of the chapter, Paul names the ringleaders, or at least I'm speculating, I think he's naming the ringleaders. Look at the very end of the chapter, verse 18. Uh, Paul says, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. Okay, so you fight, but then continue on, by rejecting this, in other words, by rejecting what I'm telling you to do, fight the good fight, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made a shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan that they might learn not to blaspheme. So the infiltrators are here, and they're named, and Paul has booted them out. How would you like that to be your name? Your name recorded in Scripture as being a false teacher whom Paul had to boot. So why did they have to part ways? Because the church has gone off the rails. It has been infiltrated by false teachers. Paul has booted the uh, presumed ringleaders, and yet Paul is still worried that their influence is going to linger on. So Paul's like, I, I did the groundwork, but I need you to finish the job. And I need you to tie up what I left loose. Or, you know, when you go camping and you see those signs that have Smokey the Bear on them, and they say, wanted, your campfire, dead, out. It's not enough to leave the fire smoldering. It might, if the wind picks up or if something happens, it could start back up and burn down the whole forest. Paul is saying, look, the, the fire is smoldering, we think it's going out, but I need you to stay here and douse it and make sure that it goes out. Other things are listed throughout 1 Timothy of what maybe this heresy included. Um, verse 7 talks about a misuse of the law. They want to be teachers of the law, but they don't know what they're talking about. You get into chapter 2, and it seems like maybe women pastors and women preachers are involved. You get into chapter 4, and it says that they forbid marriage, and they require abstinence from certain foods. You're not allowed to get married. You're not allowed to eat certain kind of foods, right? Another interesting point that is, is not entirely certain, but it's worth thinking about, uh, and that is a statement that Paul makes in Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, and that's assuming that that speech came before this letter, but Paul told the Ephesians, he says, I know that I'm never going to see you again, and I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. So Paul might have seen this coming. And now his worst fears have come true. The church that he planted has gone off the rails on behalf of some uh, false teachers. And so he left Timothy behind. Brother, we got to say goodbye. As a follow-up measure, he writes the letter of 1 Timothy. Here are your instructions. Right? As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia. We've already had this conversation, but let, re let me remind you through this letter. And so that really does two things for Timothy. One, it gives him his instructions, so he can't forget. They're written down. Two, it serves as credentials. Paul was the one who planted the Ephesian church, not Timothy. 
So it's possible that the Ephesians are going to go, who do you think you are, kid? Because as Paul writes first and second Timothy, Timothy's a young guy. So this serves as credentials. I'm not just making this stuff up. This is what Paul left me behind to do. Here's proof, a letter that he wrote. And by the way, this is very similar to the letter of Titus. Paul and Titus were in Crete or on the island of Crete. The difference is uh, Crete had many towns with many churches, and Paul left Titus behind with perhaps a lot more work to do, and he wrote a letter saying, now remember what I told you, tie up the loose ends in Crete and appoint elders in every town. So why did Paul and Timothy have to say goodbye? Because the church has gone off the rails. Paul says, I still have to go to Macedonia, but I need you to stay here and put out the rest of the fire. It's smoldering, it's probably fine, but I need you to stay here and make sure that it goes out entirely. Can you imagine how that departure must have felt for both sides? I would imagine it would be suspenseful for both sides. On the one hand, Paul is probably worried for Timothy. Now look, Paul has great confidence in Timothy. In fact, he said in Philippians 2.20, I have no one else like him. If there was somebody that Paul trusted, it was Timothy. And yet, if I planted the church and I left my son in the faith behind to clean it up instead of doing it myself, I wouldn't sleep well at night. Can you imagine how Timothy must have felt? Hey, you planted this. Maybe, maybe, how about this? I'll go to Macedonia, you stay here. Or maybe Macedonia can wait and we can both stay here. Or better yet, let's pretend we didn't see anything and go to Macedonia. Right? Can you imagine for both parties that as they're saying goodbye, this was not the plan, we were going to Macedonia, change of plans, I gotta go, I need you to stay here a suspenseful and probably a sorrowful goodbye. So here's the point. Sometimes, as much as it might hurt, the best, things, the best decision that Christians can make is to split up. It's to divide and conquer. It's to serve multiple churches instead of just one. Timothy, it's time for us to split up, and we'll see each other again. Everything's going to be okay, but we right now need to part ways. It would certainly be more comfortable if we could all congregate with our best friends, right? I don't know if you have this fantasy. I do sometimes. I have Christian friends who are in different places around the country, and you do too. And maybe we, you, maybe we have Christian friends who are spanning the globe. And don't you wish you could like have a draft pick? <laughs> and you could get all your favorite Christians and just put them in one place, and you guys would just live happily ever after, right? No. No, because it would be filled with sinners just like this church is. And you know what? We would fight just like we do. And then you would ruin all of your best friendships instead of just the less than best friendships, right? <laughs> We can't all congregate in one place. The, the perfect paradise of a church is not going to be experienced until heaven. And boy, that's going to be an unbelievable joy when we're all together and we're no longer strapped with sinful carcasses. But we're not there yet. And so sometimes the best decision that churches can make or that Christians can make is that it's time for us to split up and serve different churches. I need to go to Macedonia. I need you to stay here in, in Ephesus. Let's divide and conquer. Now the question is, why am I telling you this today? Because we have a big decision to make after church. And frankly, the decision that we have to make today is probably the first big decision in a series of big decisions that we're going to need to make over the next few years. Right? Right? And so, um, we need to make our decision today in light of what our long-term plans are. Given that the Lord Jesus doesn't return first, which we're all crossing our fingers. I hope you are. Given that the Lord Jesus doesn't return in the next year or five years or ten years, we need to ask ourselves, where are we going? What, okay, we have to move. <laughs> we have to do something, right? We've been nice and comfortable here for a couple of years. And now it's clear that we can't be comfortable anymore. Too many people. 
We have to do something. Something has to change. And so imagine that we're nomads and we've run out of resources. We've run out of food. We've run out of water. It's time for us to pack up and go. The question is, which direction are we going to go? That's the context in which we need to make today's decision. And so, uh, in light of that fact, and in light of the principle that we just read in 1 Timothy, the elders and I think it would be a good idea to share our long-term vision with you today. Okay? So, in light of the decision that we need to make today, and in light of this principle that we just read from 1 Timothy, that sometimes the best thing to do for us to div- is to divide and conquer, in light of those two things, let me give you what the elders would like to see from our church in the next five to ten years. Okay? I'm going to start with a proposition, and then I'm going to explain it as we go. Okay? Where do the elders think that we should go? We do not want to be a mega church. We want to be a sending church. We do not want to be a mega church. We want to be a sending church. Now, I just gave you a couple of loaded words, and you're going, what do you mean by both of those words? It's good that you feel that way. First of all, we don't want to be a mega church. When I say mega church, let's say a thousand. That's mega, right? That's big, right? 800. That, that, that's a big church. We don't want to get that big. We don't think that it's the Lord's will for us here at this real estate to get that big, okay? Now, for clarity, we don't think that's sinful, okay? We don't think that there's a number. Well, it's not that we don't think. There is no number in the Bible, right? There's no thou shalt not exceed 1,000 people in your congregation. That's not what we're saying. In fact, many of you and, and, and I were aware of churches that are, that are huge, and they seem like they're doing just fine. They're thriving. Or you've been members of churches that have been massive before, much bigger than us, and, and they're fine. It's, we're not saying it's a sin. In fact, you read the New Testament, <clears throat> You read about the Jerusalem church, it sounds like the Jerusalem church was huge. There were 2,000 people converted at Pentecost, and granted, most of them left. But then you read about, in Jerusalem, thousands of people coming to the Lord. And they congregated in Jerusalem, maybe in more than one church, but it sounds like the Jerusalem church was over 1,000 people. So we're not saying that it is inherently wrong and sinful to have a giant church but we don't think that's what the Lord wants for this church. And honestly, it's kind of not what the elders want for this church. Okay, we don't want to be a mega church. On the other hand, we do want to be a sending church. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that we do want to get bigger. We do want to get somewhat bigger. We would like to be able to fit more people here, but we would like to get big enough so that we have the resources to start sending people out. Okay? We'd like to get bigger, and I'm not putting a number on that. We, we actually asked in our elders meeting, what, what's the number? We don't know. We would like to get bigger, but we'd like to get big enough so that we have enough resources to start sending out pastors, missionaries, church plants, church revitalizations. Let me go through those again. Sending out pastors, missionaries, church plants, church revitalizations. We want to send out pastors. Do you remember how I got here? Some of you don't because you weren't here. Most of you don't because you weren't here. We didn't do the candidating thing. Neil, our previous pastor, called Dick Shaw, my old previous retired pastor from Caldwell First Baptist, and he said, I'm going to retire, and I'm wondering if you guys have anybody that doesn't know what's good for him." <laughs> And and Caldwell First Baptist sent me here, and it wasn't like an official Caldwell First Baptist did it, but I came here, and we got to know each other, and and you hired me. A pastor was sent from one church to another. And do you know what? In the five years that I've been here, we've had sister churches lose pastors and say, what are we going to do? We would like to be big enough where we have more elders and pastors than we need, And if a church says, look, we don't know what we're going to do, we say, you know what, we've got more elders than we know what to do with. You can have this one. And maybe... (laughs) So, you know, it's it's like when I'm not trying to be funny is when you guys think I'm funny. And then I try, and it's like, nope. Don't quit your day job. Um... 
we would like to be able to send out pastors to churches in the area or, or in other places. We would like to be able to send out missionaries. Beloved, we are praying that God will put it on your hearts to go to the ends of the earth with the gospel. To Asia, to Africa, to Europe, to South America, and not even to the ends of the world, to Utah. Preach to the Mormons. See, that was another one. That wasn't funny. <laughs> or maybe, maybe starting a full-time ministry here that the church can help you get off the ground and support. But we would like to send out missionaries. And remember a few years ago, we had the, the Pearsons come, and they, they served in Austria. And they, they said that the churches in Austria, the, a lot of the ones that they served in, it wasn't even a question about whether or not they should send missionaries. They would say, we're too small, we're too poor, we can't send out missionaries. We're not poor, but you're probably assuming that we're too small to send out missionaries. And we're praying that God will change our hearts and that some of you will go. We want to send out church plants. How many families here are driving from Caldwell and they're driving 20 or 30 minutes? Wouldn't it be nice if we could plant a church in Caldwell and you guys wouldn't have to drive so far? Or church revitalizations. You know, churches, they start dying. And you know what happens is sometimes one church will, will amputate and send out, and it hurts. But they'll send out a number of families to revitalize a church that's dying. And here we had one big thriving church and one small dying church. And now we have two thriving healthy churches. You know, that's kind of what happened here. This church was dying. And, and many of you in God's providence came here. And we would like to do more intentionally what was done here unintentionally through God's providence. Is it raining for real? It is. It's raining. Interesting. We do not want to be a mega church. We want to be a sending church. Now, let me tell you why. You might ask, why? Why not try to build the biggest church that we can here in Middleton? Or why not get to a, a large number? Okay? Let me give you a few answers to that question. Number one, because we really don't have that much space anyway. Let's say that we bought the whole block and we tore down Subway and the chiropractor and, and, and the dance studio. Let's say we tore it all down and even the mechanic and we just put parking in. How much space would that really buy us? It wouldn't buy us very much. And so to be fair, God could give us ground somewhere else and, and we could potentially build a mega church out there. And maybe that's his will for us and that I'm wrong. Pray that God will show us that I'm wrong or that the elders are wrong. And, 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 and if that's what God wants us to do, that we do that. But we're looking at what we have right now and we're saying, let's maximize this facility and this ground now. And even if we do that, it's not going to fit a thousand people. It might fit another couple hundred. Secondly, the reason that we would rather be a sending church than a mega church is because I personally, and I think the elders with me, we take incredibly seriously our call to shepherd you. You know that in the New Testament, it's not just a pastor or an elder's job to preach and to lead Bible studies and to teach. And, and the, it shouldn't be this way, but it often is, that the only time the church sees the pastor is on Sunday morning. And it's a shame. But what does the New Testament tell us? It says, elders, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Don't stand behind a pulpit and yell at them. Shepherd them. Paul said in Acts 20 to the Ephesians, he said that I, my pastoral example was that I taught in public and from house to house. Paul was in the homes of his flock. He told the elders in just a few verses later in, in Acts 20, he says, you need to pay careful attention to the flock, not just preach and teach. Pay careful attention. William Shedd, he's a Presbyterian pastor from the 19th century. He says that it's a pastor's office to give private and personal advice from house to house and to make his influence felt in the social and domestic life of his congregation. You should feel our influence in your weekly lives, and not just on Sunday mornings. J.C. Ryle says, a house-going minister makes a church-going people. We take 
incredibly seriously that God calls us to oversee you, and we don't expect to be able to do that with a thousand people. We're having a hard enough time with 200, and that's, that's the upper end. Our plates are full as it is, and granted, we need more elders, right? So pray that God will raise up more elders, and that we can identify more elders. But if we, if, we're, if we have our plate full right now, we don't expect that we're going to be able to do that well with a lot of people. So we think maybe instead of, what we sh- instead of building the biggest church that we can, maybe we should get a little bit bigger and then start sending people out. Thirdly, why do we want to be a sending church? Because we would rather have multiple healthy churches than one big church. Rather have multiple healthy churches than one big church. Fourthly, because... Uh-oh. We have lots of people driving from out of town, as I said before. And finally, because we were revitalized, which I also mentioned. The way that this church was blessed providentially, we would like to be God's instrument of blessing towards other churches more intentionally. We've been revitalized. We want to be the blessing that, that we want to bless people by helping them revitalize the way that we have, okay? So those are some of the reasons why we think it's a good idea not to, not to build the biggest church we can here, but instead to become a sending church that's, that's bigger, but is, is sending people out and not just congregating. So how about some of the questions that that raises? Because it does raise a number of questions, doesn't it? I have three questions that I thought of that that we should discuss this morning that might be on your minds, okay? Question number one, when? When are we going to be ready for this? And the simple answer is not anytime soon. We're not talking the next few months. We're talking the next couple years at least. We are not ready for this right now. But the reason I'm telling you right now is because today we have to make the decision about what we're going to do about a meeting space and what we're going to do with this building and with the other building. So we're telling you, look, it's time for us to get up and move. We want to head north. We want to head west. We want to go this way or that way. So are we ready yet? Uh, are, are, is, the, is the clock ticking for you having a seat here? No, it's not. Question number two, who? Or whom? Whom are we going to send? And to whom will we send them? And, and again, the answer is, we don't really know. We don't have anybody up our sleeve to send out. Maybe if you make John mad enough, we might find someone up our sleeve. Right, John? We're not aware of any needs at the moment, but we want to get to the place where we can. You know, it's kind of like how Paul told the Ephesians that uh, you need to work hard with your own hands so that you have extra money to help those in need. Right? You shouldn't just have money to pay your own bills. You should have extra money to help those who are in need. We don't just want to have enough for us. We want to have an abundance so that we can send people out. But we just don't, we're not there yet. Thirdly, how? How are we going to do it? That's a great question. It's a very complicated question. How do you send out pastors? How do you send out missionaries? And even more complicated and more difficult, how do you send out a church plant? How do you send out a church revitalization? That sounds like complicated business, and you're right, it is. And so, do I have an answer to that question right now? No, I don't. But I have good news for you. We have resources. Number one, we have the inspired word of Scripture. You know what Scripture says about itself? It says that it's breathed out by God, and it's profitable so that the man of God may be equipped for every good work. Is sending out pastors a good work? Sending out church plants a good work? Is sending out missionaries a good work? Is revitalizing dying churches a good work? Well, then I have good news for you. The Bible gives us the information we need to know. Now, on top of that, there are other resources and ministries out there that are dedicated to this very goal. One of them, maybe you're aware of, is called Nine Marks. And one of the things that they do is they are geared towards building churches that send out pastors and that send out church plants. And so while all of the theology is in the Bible, this ministry has ironed out a lot of the trial and error. Do this, don't do this, right? And in addition to the Bible and Nine Marks, 
We have an elder in our own congregation who has gone through this work before, and it's John Wilson. John was the pastor of Creekside Church in Eagle for a number of years, and they had a bunch of families driving to Eagle from Emmett, and so they planted a church in Emmett. And John and Hugh, who's the other elder from Creekside that they sent to pastor um, Riverside in Emmett, they said that they would love to talk to our elders in our church about some of the things that we need to look out for as we move forward in this process. So let's, let's tie this part together. Uh, this long-term goal of not being a megachurch but being a sending church, it raises a lot of questions. And frankly, we don't have a lot of answers. But do you know what? It would actually be arrogant for us to think that we have all the answers right now. Here's what James 5 says. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and we will do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. Beloved, let me clarify. We're not getting up here and saying, we, the, the, the elders of Middleton First Baptist Church, declare that on August 1st of next year, we will plant another church in Caldwell. That would be arrogant. Especially if we thought we had all of our ducks in a row, and that you guys were just going to blindly go through with it. What we want to do is, is hazy, and it raises lots of questions, and we don't have all the answers to those questions. But we're praying that if this is the Lord's will, that he will move us in that direction. That's really what this comes down to. Is this what God wants for Middleton First Baptist Church? We don't know. But that's what we think, and we're open to being corrected. So we're praying if the Lord wills, that we will start moving in this direction. And so the question is, what should we do? You might think there's no application today. There is application today. Actually, really, all of this is application. But what should you do when you go home today? You know what I'm going to tell you to do? Pray. Pray. Pray that God will show us his will. Pray that he will help us to overcome obstacles. Pray that he will correct us where we are wrong. Pray, pray, pray. You know, I just finished uh, George Mueller's autobiography, and many of you are familiar with him. He ran orphanages in um, England. He was actually from Germany, but he, was, he had orphanages in England. And, you know, they had this problem. They did not actually have an orphanage. They were renting houses on the same street. They had like three, or, three to five houses on the same street that were all filled with orphans. And you know what? It was causing problems for the neighborhood. <laughs> and, and George Mueller thought, you know what? Maybe God wants us to build a big house out in the country where we can fit more kids, and then we won't be a nuisance to our neighbors anymore. So you know what George Mueller did? He just started praying. In fact, do you know what George Mueller did not do? He didn't tell anyone. He told his wife, and he and his wife just started praying every day, Lord, if you want us to build an orphanage out in the country, then you know it's gonna, we're going to need land. You know we're going to need millions of dollars. You know all the obstacles that are getting in the way. Lord, please help us to get there. And you know what? They prayed for over two years, and over the course of two years, they got everything that they needed, and they were in an orphanage. And then he did it again years later. Or rather, God did it through him years later. And, and you know what's funny about that? I have been dreading all of this for years. I have. Because we've seen this coming. We've known, we, we've suspected that we were going to outgrow our facilities. And, and, and I have been dreading this decision making and all of this for the last few years. And do you know what? After reading George Mueller's biography, I'm not dreading it anymore. I'm excited. I'm confident. I'm not confident in me. I'm not confident in the infallibility of the elders. I'm confident that God will take us where he wants us to go. Amen? Amen. I'm confident that it's our job to seek God's will and to remain united. And God will take us where he wants us to go. And if it means that we need millions of dollars, if it, need, if it means that we need to go to war with the city, if it means all kinds of troubles are going to be in our way, then so be it. 
If the Lord wants us to do it, and if we're seeking his will, he will take us where he wants us to go. And so right now, we can start praying. Mark chapter 11, Jesus says, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and he doesn't doubt in his heart, but he believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Now, I don't think Jesus is literally talking about a mountain there. It, it, as far as I'm aware, that's never happened in history. And you would think that someone had the faith to do that before this point. So I think Jesus was being metaphorical there. But I do think he was getting at a point that if you pray and you don't doubt, and if you pray, and I see John adds this qualification in 1 John. This is the confidence that we have towards him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us, and we know that if he hears us, we have the request that we've asked. Beloved, the question comes down to, is this God's will? And the answer is, we don't know. God, I don't expect him to jump on my TV and tell me where and when, and, and I, I don't expect that. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says that the secret things belong to the Lord, but that which is revealed belongs to us and our children forever, that we may confirm the words of this law. There, well, here, what is the secret will of God? Where we're going to be in five years. Where we're going to be in 10 years. But what is the revealed will of God which belongs to us? Pray, remain united. Preach the gospel. So what should we pray for? Number one, pray that God will give us wisdom. James tells us that if anyone lacks wisdom and he asks God, God will give wisdom graciously to all without reproach. Pray that God will give this flock and these elders and deacons wisdom about where he wants us to go. Secondly, pray that God will give us the resources. He has been overly and abundantly blessing us with resources so far, hasn't he? He can do that. Remember in Psalm 50, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. If I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. God owns a lot of cattle. God owns a lot of precious metals. Money is no object for him. It's no obstacle for him. And so pray that whatever God wants us to do, that he would provide the resources for us to do it. Because three, pray that God will help us to overcome obstacles. Beloved, I don't think this is going to be smooth sailing, if I'm honest with you. I don't think it's going to be as simple as us just filling out a permit and, and doing whatever we want to do. I think that we are going to face a number of obstacles, both internally and externally. So the question isn't, how can we get through this without getting hit? It's, how can we get through this while taking the blows and while overcoming the obstacles and while giving God glory all the while? Fourthly, pray that God will help us to keep our eyes on the goal. And I, and I got to tell you, I feel really weird about not bringing this part up until now. What is the goal here? Why do we want to do this? Is it just so that we can conserve space? Is it just so that we can get rid of people that we don't want here? <laughs> Friends, the goal is that the name of Christ be proclaimed in more churches. Amen? The goal is that the name of the risen Jesus Christ be proclaimed in more churches. Beloved, we have no lack of churches that don't proclaim Christ. We have no lack of churches that proclaim the name of Christ, but when you get to know him, he's a different Christ than the one we find in the Bible. They're everywhere. And so why are we doing this? It's not so that we can build an empire it's not so that people can remember the name of Middleton First Baptist Church. It's so that in more churches in our valley and, in a, and abroad, people hear the gospel, the power of God unto salvation. That's what this is about. Friends, you and I don't need to be remembered. Somebody said in church history, preach the gospel and die and be forgotten. And you think about the, the lists of disciples that we read in the New Testament. What do you know about Thaddeus, Bartholomew, Judas, not Iscariot? We don't really know anything about them, do we? But do you know what we do know? They belong to Christ and they died in him. Isn't that enough for us? Whatever we do, people can hear about it or not. 
May we be found faithful to the name of Jesus Christ. And though we die, and though we're forgotten, and, and no matter what happens before the Lord returns, the reason that we want to be a sending church is because we don't want to be a giant church in the middle of Middleton that preaches the gospel and lets everybody else out there die and wither away. Not that that would happen. We want to be a part of the Great Commission in preaching the gospel unto all creation and, and, and sending out more believers to pastor churches, to revitalize churches, to plant churches here and abroad. We want Christ's name to be glorified. And in this season, the elders think the best way to do that is not to build a mega church, but rather to build a church that's a bit bigger and then start splitting and sending. Sometimes the best thing to do is to divide and conquer. Lots of questions. We don't have a lot of answers. Again, I know you probably think I'm joking. I'm not. Maybe Jesus will return first. That would be better, wouldn't it? Amen. Amen. But if he doesn't, we've got some planning to do. So, will you commit to praying with me about this business? Will you commit to praying with our elders about all of this? Some of you already have been. Some of you have been praying about this for years, and the Lord is, is moving your prayers along, and, and that's a wonderful thing. But beloved, we need to get to praying. Will you commit to praying with me? I want to say every day, but let's say not every day. Let's say you can miss a couple days a week, okay? Will you pray with me and with our elders and deacons and with the rest of our flock that God will move us in the direction that he wants us to go? Let's pray now. O oh, great God of highest heaven, you created all things out of nothing and by your will they exist. You own the cattle on a thousand hills and all wisdom is yours. Yours is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever and ever. You have been so gracious and merciful to this flock for 130 years. And you have been gracious and merciful and faithful to your people from the beginning of time. Whoever believes in your name is never put to shame, and Lord, you have never let one of us down even once. Lord, forgive us for our faithlessness. You have cared for us our entire lives, and yet we still struggle to believe that you care for us. And more than that, we struggle to ask you for things, great or small. Lord, I have been faithless. I have not been excited. And yet, Lord, it is a privilege to know you, to be joined to your son, to your church, to be included in your plans. And we have taken all of this for granted, and instead we've grumbled and complained. Thank you, Lord, that we know the end of the story. We don't know how this episode plays out. We don't know how this chapter ends. But we do know that in the end, Lord, you win. Thank you for the confidence and the peace that you grant us in knowing the end of your story. Now, Lord, we pray for wisdom. Your word tells us that if we lack wisdom, you will give it to us without reproach. Help us to see what direction we ought to go in. Keep us united as a flock. Keep our eyes on you and help our decisions to be made in light of the gospel and the Great Commission. Protect us, guide us, carry us for all of these decisions and for the rest of our lives. And would you glorify yourself as we seek to divide and conquer and to become a church who sins. We pray all of this in the name of your son, Jesus, for his glory. Amen.